Okay, so one of the things we care most about when we're talking about program evaluation is that we want to have evidence that a program works. Um, and that's one of the things that we're gathering given all of this data that we're swimming in. Um, we want to gather enough evidence to prove to um, funders or to stakeholders or to the general public that the money that they're donating or the money they're paying through taxes is effective at, at doing the program that you care about. Um, but in order to talk about um, this type of evidence, you need to be able to link that evidence with this idea of causation. You have to say that this program is causing something to happen. Um, but causation is tricky. Um, and it's not just public policy that faces this, um, this problem of causation. Um, even medicine um, for centuries has, has worried um, about causation. If you take this medicine, if you eat this mushroom, um, what will happen? What will be the effect of, of that treatment? Um, and it wasn't until the 1950s that this kind of evidence-based medicine became a really popular approach to, to figuring out uh, medical issues. Um, so this picture here is Jonas Salk administering um, some polio shots during some polio trials um, back in the 1950s. Um, this was one of the first uh, large-scale, randomized, controlled medical trials. Um, these polio shots were administered blindly with a placebo. The kids didn't know what kind of shot they were getting. The doctor didn't know what kind of shot they were giving. Um, and as a result, they were able to measure the effect of this vaccination. Um, and they found that it did have an effect and it was able to um, cure and treat polio um, and vaccinate kids against getting polio in the future. Um, but that only worked because of this process of kind of the scientific method where they, um, or this, this double blind study, this double blind randomized controlled trial approach to medicine. And since then, um, it kind of became the standard for the FDA. Um, if you want to have some sort of medicine approved, you have to go through a double blind trial. You have to go through experiments and lots and lots of different kinds of experiments in different populations in order to gather enough evidence to prove that the thing works. Um, and so evidence-based medicine nowadays is kind of all the rage. We love this stuff um, because we want to um, figure out kind of the best approach to um, public health and to private health and to fixing medical issues. Um, so there's a movement um, among some doctors, especially the data-oriented doctors, um, to essentially do this to everything. Um, to apply evidence to all clinical treatment decisions. Um, so you could theoretically go into a clinic, um, have it scan you, get your temperature, um, get your heart rate and blood pressure, and then use fancy algorithms to determine if you're normal or abnormal, and then try to guess your symptoms based on other algorithms. So it's basically like self-driving cars, but self-driving doctors. Um, and so there's this promotion of this move away from clinical judgment and craft knowledge, um, which is this idea that doctors go to med school for years and years so they can see different, um, different collect constellations of symptoms, different collections of, or, of, of diseases, so that they can figure out how to best identify and best diagnose people. Um, but the idea here is if we can apply this, this standard of evidence, this rigorous evidence based on all sorts of algorithms and, and thousands and thousands of other patients, we can skip all of that um, and move away from this idea of, of clinical judgment and everything will be perfect. Um, the question about this, though, is, is this good? Um, do we want to have perfect evidence for every um, medical symptom that exists in the world and kind of move away from this craft knowledge of doctors just knowing things because they saw it in a textbook once or they saw a, patient's 20, a patient 20 years ago that had the same issue? Um, and I would argue no. As much as I like data and I love evidence, um, there is a place for this idea of craft knowledge and clinical judgment. Doctors see things and they, they understand connections better than, than algorithms. Um, so even though we have powerful algorithms, we can do all sorts of cool connections between temperature and blood pressure and other symptoms to guess at people's diseases, um, it's not gonna be perfect. We still need people with expertise in there to connect kind of their wisdom with the data that's available. Um, the same thing happens in the policy world. Um, so at the same time that the polio vaccine was, was being um, trialed, um, the public policy world also started getting in on this randomized control trial um, 
train. Um, so in the 1950s, the RAND Corporation ran a large-scale um, randomized control trial over multiple years um, because it was after World War II um, and policymakers wanted to figure out the best way to provide health care for America. And so they ran this, this trial to see what would happen if they gave different groups different types of insurance. Um, either like public insurance, like Medicare and Medicaid, or private insurance um, based through your employer, which is what we have nowadays. And so what they found is that having cost sharing um, systems like private insurance and HMOs, they found that that reduced inappropriate and unnecessary medical care, and it lowered the overall use of medical care which meant it saved money for um, doctors and hospitals because they didn't have to give as much care. Um, but they also found that it reduced appropriate and needed medical care. And so because it became more expensive for people to access medicine, um, they didn't do it as much. And so it was cheaper for insurance companies and cheaper for employers and cheaper for the government. And so we ended up going that route because of a randomized control trial. And that's in part why we have the health insurance system we have today, um, because it was based on this, this multi-year study that was done to gather enough evidence to prove that it was good at saving costs. And it, it's worked out really well. Um, another um, policy experiment that's been going on for the past few years is this, uh, this um, experiment in, er, in Oregon. Um, following the Affordable Care Act, um, one of the requirements of that law was that states had to expand access to Medicaid um, based on the poverty line. And so um, most states did um, expand Medicaid. Many states did not. Um, Oregon did expand um, access to Medicaid up to 138% of the poverty line, which is what was required by law. But they also had a whole bunch of extra money based on federal grants and other sources of money. And so what they did is they decided to expand Medicaid to people beyond the 138% threshold. Um, they didn't have enough money to expand it to everybody up to whatever threshold they chose. And so they instead used a lottery system. And so you could um, randomly get Medicaid. Um, so you didn't need private insurance anymore. You could get government public insurance. Um, and so because of this, this random lottery, um, economists and public health um, researchers have been able to study the effect of having improved access to medical care um, on health, on stress, on employment, on all sorts of different outcomes. Um, and they can do it um, with good plausible causal stories because it was a lottery. People were randomly assigned to get extra medical care. And so they were able to, um, they can plausibly talk about this as an experiment. Um, the results of this study are still ongoing. Um, there's no clear results. There are some preliminary results that people are using the hospital system more. Um, which makes sense because if you haven't been able to access the hospital system because you were poor, and suddenly you have Medicaid, you're going to go to the hospital more. So not super surprising. Um, other um, famous federal experiments, um, the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, they ran this, this multi-year um, randomized control trial called Moving to Opportunity. Um, the idea here is that um, researchers back in the 70s had this idea that people were poor because the neighborhood dynamics made it so that they were poor. Um, if you lived in a poor neighborhood, you were most likely to be poor yourself. And so what they wanted to do was experiment and see if you moved somebody who was poor out of a poor neighborhood into a rich neighborhood, would that fix poverty? And so they ran this lottery system where they were able to give vouchers out to people um, that either let them stay in their, in their home neighborhoods um, or let them move to public housing outside of their neighborhood to some other state um, where they could then use that voucher um, to live in a more wealthy neighborhood. Um, and so what they found as a result of this has been going on for like 30 years now, um, 40 years now, um, that it didn't really have an impact on earnings or on educational attainment for the people who were moved. Um, in part because that's kind of a, a big traumatic event to just like uproot your life and move to a brand new state in a completely different class structure. And that, that's hard. Um, but what they did find is that the kids of the people who moved um, have done better. Um, and have um, had higher rates of graduation from high school. Um, they have higher incomes. Um, and in part, that's because of better access to schools. Um, 
there is a weird threshold there where if you were, I think it was above 16 when your family moved, then you don't get those benefits. But if you were under 16, then you do go, get those benefits. And we can measure those benefits um, plausibly with a causal story because it was done as an experiment. Um, the final example, um, a state level, a randomized control trial that Tennessee did um, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, they were interested in the effect of different class sizes in um, elementary schools on test scores and other measures of student achievement right. um, because they wanted to know if having a smaller class was better for um, a student outcomes. Yeah. And not surprisingly, they found that having a small class is better for student outcomes. Yeah. And the recommendation was to have smaller classes. Um, but that's expensive. And so the legislature didn't do that. But there's a whole body of evidence showing that small class sizes and class sizes in elementary schools is actually really effective for improving test scores and improving all sorts of student outcomes. And we have good evidence for that based on randomized control trials done at a large um, state level. Um, so that's exciting. Um, so there's actually this whole industry of, of ways of gathering policy evidence. Um, there's the Jamil Poverty Action Lab, or JPAL. They're based at MIT. Um, the two people who run or who founded JPAL, um, Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee, um, they got the Nobel Prize in 2019 for economics um, because of all of their work with randomized trials. What they do is they work in the developing world. Um, they do all sorts of randomized, small scale randomized control trials in um, Latin America and Africa and Asia, um, testing different ways of addressing issues of poverty. And they've gotten all sorts of um, good press coverage and they have this giant body of evidence of things that work in international development. Um, another project that's helpful is this Campbell collaboration. Um, if you Google them or if you go to the notes um, on this slide, press P and it should show you the notes and you can click on the link there. Um, this is just a massive database of evidence um, for any policy you can think of. So if you want to know if there's evidence for specific educational problems or educational policy issues you're concerned about, um, this will link you to all sorts of um, policy papers and white papers and um, published academic research that have evidence to support um, different policy proposals. Um, and it's this big database. It's really useful. You should all go check that out and see what exists for the policies you're interested in. Um, so all of this raises an important question here, which is, should we have evidence for every policy or program? Um, and just like this idea of um, not turning everything to evidence-based medicine and turning over our whole medical system to algorithms and robots, I would argue, no. As important as it is to gather evidence, that's the whole point of this class, we care about this. Um, there's still space for this idea of art and craft and intuition in policy. Um, if you're a policymaker who's been working in, in a space for like 40 years, you probably have an intuition of what's going to work and what's not going to work. Um, regardless of whatever RCT evidence you get shows, um, you're going to have a feel for whether or not it's feasible. Um, and in some situations, it's impossible to actually run a randomized control trial. Um, for instance, smoking, um, we know that there's a link between smoking and lung cancer. Um, but there has never been a randomized controlled trial to prove that, um, in part because it'd be wildly unethical to do one. Um, the only way you'd be able to do that is if you could randomly assign a whole bunch of people to smoke for 40 years and randomly assign 40 or a bunch of other people to not smoke for 40 years and then see what happens at the end of 40 years. Um, good luck getting approval for that. That's like not ethical at all. Um, but even though there has not been a randomized controlled trial for it, we feel fairly convinced by the observational evidence that exists out in the world that there is a link between smoking and cancer. Um, very clear link. That has not always been the case. Um, in the 1980s, um, there were all sorts of congressional hearings on the link between um, uh, smoking and cancer. Um, the tobacco industry fought this very hard. Um, they used all sorts of statistics to prove that it's not actually linked. They used the correlation is not causation story over and over and over again, saying they're correlated, but there's no causal link between smoking and cancer. We have to run a trial to figure it out, but we can't run a trial because it's unethical, so no link. Um, but that's not actually the case. There is a link, 
and we've been able to find that through other causal tools that we'll be covering in this class. Um, so beyond that, there's also space for intuition and kind of the craft of policy. Um, so with underage drinking laws, for instance, um, in the 1970s, experts, uh, policy experts were saying that reducing the drinking age um, might be okay um, because maybe it's okay if we let all 18-year-olds drink um, and it's not going to have any big public health um, consequences. And so what happened is 26 states during the 1970s decided to lower their drinking age to 18. And they did it kind of just they didn't coordinate. It just kind of happened as kind of a, it just happened because of, of state politics. Um, but that also meant that um, whatever 50 minus 26 is, 24 states did not lower their drinking age. And so researchers saw this and they said, hey, this looks like almost an experiment. Um, and so they were able to track highway fatalities based on drunk driving um, in those different states, the states that did lower the age and the states that didn't. And they found that highway fatalities increased by 10% um, for 18 year olds when the drinking age is lower. And so hundreds of more people were dying a year because of these lower drinking laws. Um, and so as a way, uh, as a result of that, um, these legislator, these state legislatures were able to re-raise the drinking age back up to 21 um, because they saw that there was evidence that it wasn't working and it was actually bad for public health. And so it, it went back up. Um, and so this is fascinating because um, they didn't run a pre-trial to figure it out. They just kind of experimented and they saw what happened and then they adjusted after. And that is a perfectly acceptable way of, of evaluating policy. You can't run a randomized controlled trial before you implement any sort of policy. Sometimes you just have to invent a policy and see what happens. But um, the important thing is that you have to be open to changing and open to adjusting those policies as the evidence comes in. So where does um, program evaluation fit in with all of this and why do we care about this in this class? Um, it is the method for collecting evidence for these policies. Um, that's what we're doing. We are evidence collectors and analyzers, and we're trying to prove causation. Um, there's a whole bunch of different types of evaluation. Um, what we're mostly focusing on this class, here, let me get myself out of the way so you can see them all here. Um, so there's this textbook here that I'm not having you buy, in part because it's like 100 bucks. Um, and we will be reading a couple chapters from this that I've, I've gotten from the library, um, but everything else is less important. Um, in this book, they lay out five different types of evaluation at different stages of the policy process. There's needs assessment, which you do before you implement a policy or before you even think about a policy. It's a way of kind of measuring the need for it. Um, there's design and theory assessment, which is what you do while you're designing the, the program. Um, there's process evaluation and monitoring. Um, which is just making sure that the program that you are running is running smoothly. Um, and so this is just like monitoring to make sure um, the right number of, of resources are being um, passed out to different departments and everything's running smoothly. Impact evaluation is what we are focusing on in this class here. Um, this is um, a way of measuring whether or not the program is having its intended impact and if it's doing what it's supposed to do and causing the social change that it's supposed to cause. Um, the final kind here we're not gonna talk much about, it's efficiency evaluation, it's just whether or not the program is, is running smoothly um, from a cost perspective. Um, this is a form of cost benefit analysis, the CBA here. Um, so do the costs of the program, um, do the benefits of the program outweigh the costs? So that, that's that world there. But we're not gonna care about that so much. Um, what we care most about is this idea of impact evaluation. Um, each of these types of evaluation show up in different aspects of what is called a logic model. This right here is a logic model. And you will draw one of these for a program of your choice um, during the semester here. But what this logic model essentially does is it shows you a map of how all of the different components of a program work together. So you have inputs and you have outputs and you have activities and you have outcomes. And so inputs are, are kind of the inputs to the program. So money, um, participants in the program, they do different activities. Those activities create outputs and then those outputs lead to outcomes. 
And so these different types of evaluation focus on different aspects of this logic model. So the needs assessment will make sure that the activities are necessary. Um, a cost benefit analysis will make sure that the costs of the different inputs um, are lower than the benefits that you get from the different outputs. Um, what we care most about is this world here, the outcomes, which we can zoom in here. This is impact evaluation. Um, we're here, we want to see if the program that, we, that we're interested in is causing something to happen later on, is causing the different outcomes. So in this, this was a truancy intervention um, that was a program that was implemented by a school district in Provo, Utah. Um, I helped run a program evaluation, um, impact evaluation as an MPA student a few years ago for this school district. And the idea there was that um, because of this program, it was intervening um, with kids who were being absent too much. Um, if they went through this program, it would reduce truancy, it would increase their commitment to school, it would increase, increase their grades and reduce the risk factors for juvenile delinquency. So these were kind of the outcomes that the program cared about. Um, this was the program itself. And so our job as MPA students for this project was to see if, this act, if these activities, if this program itself was causing the changes that we cared about here um, and having the impact that we wanted on these long-term outcomes. And that's, that was tricky. We had to do all sorts of interesting stats things and interesting causation related things. The things that we'll be covering in this class to be able to prove that this program caused these things to happen. Um, and so that is impact evaluation. Um, that's the reason why we are focusing on, like this is one of our textbooks here. This is a, a book published by the World Bank. Um, this is one of your main textbooks, it's free. Um, and it's all about impact evaluation, not needs assessment, not monitoring, not cost benefit analysis, just the impact side of this stuff. So that's what we're gonna be focusing on in this class. Um, another way of looking at it here is um, with this graph, um, what we're trying to measure is um, we have some sort of outcome that we care about. Um, before the program, there's some level of the outcome. It doesn't matter what this is. Every program has some pre-program outcome. The program happens. And then the idea for this class, everything we're trying to do statistically, is to measure this difference right here, where what we're going to say is that people who didn't do the program will have some sort of outcome. People who did do the program will have a different outcome, and we want to measure how big of an effect that is and if that is statistically significant. And if it is, then we can say we have a causal story. This program has a causal effect on this outcome, and it made that happen. Um, if we can't, then we don't have evidence that the program worked. And so this is the kind of thing that we're going to be looking at throughout, looking at throughout the semester is how to get this effect, how to measure this effect correctly. Um, with the Provo School District, this is the actual graph that we used um, in our presentation and in our analysis. Um, we looked at um, average number of absences and tardies or lateness or being late. Um, so this is the average number of absences for students before they got involved in the program. So you can see weeks before it was increasing, increasing, increasing. The program happened. And then based on our statistical methods, we predicted that they would have kept going and kind of flattened out. But because of the program, it actually dropped down significantly. And so what we were able to present to the school district was that this difference right here was the causal effect of the program. Um, and then they were then able to go talk to the state funding agency for the Department of Education in Utah and got a whole bunch more funding for their program because they could prove that it had a causal effect on student absences. Um, and so it worked, um, which is super exciting. And hopefully you'll be able to do similar things um, as a result of this class.